Chapter 9 of The Cruise of the Snark. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Brian Ness. The Cruise of the Snark by Jack London. Chapter 9 A Pacific Traverse. Sandwich Islands to Tahiti. There is great difficulty in making this passage across the trades. The whalers and all others speak with great doubt of fetching Tahiti from the Sandwich Islands. Captain Bruce says that a vessel should keep to the northward until she gets a start of wind before bearing for her destination. In his passage between them, in November 1837, he had no variables near the line in coming south and never could make easting on either tack, though he endeavored by every means to do so. So say the sailing directions for the South Pacific Ocean, and that is all they say. There's not a word more to help the weary voyager in making this long traverse, nor is there any word at all concerning the passage from Hawaii to the Marquesas, which lie some 800 miles to the southeast of Tahiti, and which are the more difficult to reach by just that much. The reason for the lack of directions is, I imagine, that no voyager is supposed to make himself weary by attempting so impossible a traverse. But the impossible did not deter the snark, principally because of the fact that we did not read that particular little paragraph in the sailing directions until after we had started. We sailed from Hilo, Hawaii on October 7, and arrived at Nukahiva in the Marquesas on December 6, the distance was 2,000 miles as the crow flies, while we actually traveled at least 4,000 miles to accomplish it, thus proving for once and forever that the shortest distance between two points is not always a straight line. Had we headed directly for the Marquesas, we might have traveled five or 6,000 miles. Upon one thing we were resolved, we would not cross the line west of 130 degrees west longitude, for here was the problem. To cross the line to the west of that point, if the southeast trade winds were well around to the southeast, would throw us so far to leeward of the Marquesas that a head-beat would be maddeningly impossible. Also, we had to remember the equatorial current, which moves west at a rate of anywhere from 12 to 75 miles a day. A pretty pickle, indeed, to be to leeward of our destination with such a current in our teeth. No, not a minute nor a second west of 130 degrees west longitude would we cross the line. But since the southeast trade winds were to be expected five or six degrees north of the line, which, if they were well around to the southeast or south-southeast, would necessitate our sliding off toward south-southwest, we should have to hold to the eastward, north of the line and north of the southeast trades, until we gained at least 128 degrees west longitude. I have forgotten to mention that the 70-horsepower gasoline engine, as usual, was not working, and that we could depend upon wind alone. Neither was the launch engine working, and while I am about it, I may as well confess that the 5-horsepower, which ran the lights, fans, and pumps, was also on the sick list. A striking title for a book haunts me, Waking and Sleeping, I should like to write the book some day and call it Around the World with Three Gasoline Engines and a Wife. But I am afraid I shall not write it for fear of hurting the feelings of some of the young gentlemen of San Francisco, Honolulu, and Hilo who learned their trades at the expense of the Snark's engines. It looked easy on paper. Here was Hilo, and there was our objective, 128 degrees west longitude. With the northeast trade blowing, we could travel a straight line between the two points and even slack our sheets off a goodly bit. But one of the chief troubles with the trades is that one never knows just where he will pick them up and just in what direction they will be blowing. We picked up the northeast trade right outside of Hilo Harbor. But the miserable breeze was away around into the east. Then there was the north equatorial current setting westward like a mighty river. Furthermore, a small boat, by the wind and bucking into a big head sea, does not work to advantage. She jogs up and down and gets nowhere. 
her sails are full and straining every little while she presses her lee rail under she flounders and bumps and splashes and that is all whenever she begins to gather way she runs kerchug into a big mountain of water and is brought to a standstill so with the snark the resultant of her smallness of the trade around into the east and of the strong equatorial current was a long sag south oh she did not go quite south but the easting she made was distressing on october eleven she made forty miles easting october twelve fifteen miles october thirteen no easting october fourteen thirty miles october fifteen twenty three miles october sixteen eleven miles and on october seventeen she actually went to the westward four miles thus in a week she made one hundred and fifteen miles easting which was equivalent to sixteen miles a day but between the longitude of hilo and one hundred twenty eight degrees west longitude is a difference of twenty seven degrees or roughly sixteen hundred miles at sixteen miles a day one hundred days would be required to accomplish this distance and even then our objective one hundred twenty eight degrees west longitude was five degrees north of the line while nuka Hiva in the marquesas lay nine degrees south of the line and twelve degrees to the west there remained only one thing to do to work south out of the trade and into the variables it is true that captain bruce found no variables on his traverse and that he never could make easting on either tack it was the variables or nothing with us and we prayed for better luck than he had had the variables constitute the belt of ocean lying between the trades and the doldrums and are conjectured to be the draughts of heated air which rise in the doldrums flow high in the air counter to the trades and gradually sink down till they fan the surface of the ocean where they are found and they are found where they are found for they are wedged between the trades and the doldrums which same shift their territory from day to day and month to month we found the variables in eleven degrees north latitude and eleven degrees north latitude we hugged jealously to the south lay the doldrums to the north lay the northeast trade that refused to blow from the northeast the days came and went and always they found the snark somewhere near the eleventh parallel the variables were truly variable a light headwind would die away and leave us rolling in a calm for forty-eight hours then a light headwind would spring up blow for three hours and leave us rolling in another calm for forty-eight hours then hurrah the wind would come out of the west fresh beautifully fresh and send the snark along wing and wing her wake bubbling the log line straight astern at the end of a half an hour while we were preparing to set the spinnaker with a few sickly gasps the wind would die away and so it went we wagered optimistically on every favorable fan of air that lasted over five minutes but it never did any good the fans faded out just the same but there were exceptions in the variables if you wait long enough something is bound to happen and we were so plentifully stocked with food and water that we could afford to wait on october twenty six we actually made one hundred and three miles of easting and we talked about it for days afterwards once we caught a moderate gale from the south which blew itself out in eight hours but it helped us to seventy-one miles of easting in that particular twenty-four hours and then just as it was expiring the wind came straight out from the north the directly opposite quarter and fanned us along over another degree of easting in years and years no sailing vessel has attempted this traverse and we found ourselves in the midst of one of the loneliest of the pacific solitudes in the sixty days we were crossing it we sighted no sail lifted no steamer's smoke above the horizon a disabled vessel could drift in this deserted expanse for a dozen generations and there would be no rescue the only chance of rescue would be from a vessel like the snark and the snark happened to be there principally because of the fact that the traverse had been begun before the particular paragraph in the sailing directions had been read standing upright on deck a straight line drawn from the eye to the horizon would measure three miles and a half thus seven miles was the diameter of the circle of the sea in which we had our centre since we remained always in the centre and since we constantly were moving in some direction we looked upon many circles 
but all circles looked alike. No tufted islets, gray headlands, nor glistening patches of white canvas ever marred the symmetry of that unbroken curve. Clouds came and went, rising up over the rim of the circle, flowing across the space of it, and spilling away and down across the opposite rim. The world faded as the procession of the weeks marched by. The world faded until at last there ceased to be any world except the little world of the snark, freighted with her seven souls and floating on the expanse of the waters. Our memories of the world, the great world, became like dreams of former lives we had lived somewhere before we came to be born on the snark. After we had been out of fresh vegetables for some time, we mentioned such things in much the same way I have heard my father mention the vanished apples of his boyhood. Man is a creature of habit, and we on the snark had got the habit of the snark. Everything about her and aboard her was as a matter of course, and anything different would have been an irritation and an offense. There was no way by which the great world could intrude. Our bell rang the hours, but no caller ever rang it. There were no guests to dinner, no telegrams, no insistent telephone jangles invading our privacy. We had no engagements to keep, no trains to catch, and there were no morning newspapers over which to waste time in learning what was happening to our fifteen hundred million other fellow creatures. But it was not dull. The affairs of our little world had to be regulated, and, unlike the great world, our world had to be steered in its journey through space. Also, there were cosmic disturbances to be encountered, and baffled, such as do not afflict the big earth in its frictionless orbit through the windless void, and we never knew from moment to moment what was going to happen next. There were spice and variety enough and to spare. Thus, at four in the morning, I relieve Herman at the wheel. East northeast, he gives me the course. She's eight points off, but she ain't steering. Small wonder the vessel does not exist that can be steered in so absolute a calm. I had a breeze a little while ago. Maybe it will come back again, Herman says hopefully, ere he starts forward to the cabin and his bunk. The mizzen is in and fast furled. In the night, what of the roll and the absence of wind, it had made life too hideous to be permitted to go on rasping at the mast, smashing at the tackles, and buffeting the empty air into hollow outbursts of sound. But the big mainsail is still on, and the staysail, jib, and flying jib are snapping and slashing at their sheets with every roll. Every star is out. Just for luck I put the wheel hard over in the opposite direction to which it had been left by Herman, and I lean back and gaze up at the stars. There's nothing else for me to do. There is nothing to be done with a sailing vessel rolling in a stark calm. Then I feel a fan on my cheek, faint, so faint that I can just sense it ere it is gone. But another comes, and another, until a real and just perceptible breeze is blowing. How the snark's sails manage to feel it is beyond me, but feel it they do, as she does as well, for the compass card begins slowly to revolve in the binnacle. In reality, it is not revolving at all. It is held by terrestrial magnetism in one place, and it is the snark that is revolving, pivoted upon that delicate cardboard device that floats in a closed vessel of alcohol. So the snark comes back on her course, the breath increases to a tiny puff, the snark feels the weight of it, and actually heels over a trifle. There is flying scud overhead, and I notice the stars being blotted out. Walls of darkness close in upon me, so that when the last star is gone, the darkness is so near that it seems I can reach out and touch it on every side. When I lean toward it, I can feel it loom against my face. Puff follows puff and I am glad the mizzen is furled. Phew! That was a stiff one. The snark goes over and down until her lee rail is buried, and the whole Pacific Ocean is pouring in. Four or five of these gusts make me wish that the jib and flying jib were in. The sea is picking up, the gusts are growing stronger and more frequent, and there is a splatter of wet in the air. There's no use in attempting to gaze to windward. The wall of blackness is within arm's length. Yet I cannot help attempting to see and gauge the blows that are being struck at the snark. There is something ominous and menacing up there to windward, and I have a feeling that if I look long enough and strong enough I shall divine it. Futile feeling. Between two gusts I leave the wheel and run forward to the cabin companionway where I light matches and consult the barometer. 
2990, it reads. That sensitive instrument refuses to take notice of the disturbance which is humming with a deep, throaty voice in the rigging. I get back to the wheel just in time to meet another gust, the strongest yet. Well, anyway, the wind is a beam, and the snark is on her course, eating up easting. That at least is well. The jib and the flying jib bother me, and I wish they were in. She would make easier weather of it, and less risky weather likewise. The wind snorts, and stray raindrops pelt like birdshot. I shall certainly have to call all hands, I conclude, then conclude the next instant to hang on a little longer. Maybe this is the end of it, and I shall have called them for nothing. It is better to let them sleep. I hold the snark down to her task, and from out of the darkness at right angles comes a deluge of rain accompanied by shrieking wind. Then everything eases except the blackness, and I rejoice in that I have not called them in. No sooner does the wind ease than the sea picks up. The combers are breaking now, and the boat is tossing like a cork. Then out of the blackness the gusts come harder and faster than before. If only I knew what was up there to windward in the blackness. The snark is making heavy weather of it, and her lee rail is buried oftener than not. More shrieks and snorts of wind. Now, if ever is the time to call the men, I will call them, I resolve. Then there is a burst of rain, a slackening of the wind, and I do not call. But it is rather lonely there at the wheel, steering a little world through howling blackness. It is quite a responsibility to be all alone on the surface of a little world, in time of stress, doing the thinking for its sleeping inhabitants. I recoil from the responsibility, as more gusts begin to strike, and as a sea licks along the weather rail and splashes over into the cockpit. The salt water seems strangely warm to my body, and is shot through with ghostly nodules of phosphorescent light. I shall surely call all hands to shorten sail. Why should they sleep? I am a fool to have any compunctions in the matter. My intellect is arrayed against my heart. It was my heart that said, let them sleep. Yes, but it was my intellect that backed up my heart in that judgment. Let my intellect then reverse the judgment, and while I am speculating as to what particular entity issued that command to my intellect, the gusts die away. Solicitude for mere bodily comfort has no place in practical seamanship, I conclude sagely, but study the feel of the next series of gusts and do not call them in. After all, it is my intellect behind everything, procrastinating, measuring its knowledge of what the snark can endure against the blows being struck at her, and waiting the call of all hands against the striking of still severer blows. Daylight, gray and violent, steals through the cloud pall and shows a foaming sea that flattens under the weight of recurrent and increasing squalls. Then comes the rain, filling the windy valleys of the sea with milky smoke, and further flattening the waves, which but wait for the easement of wind and rain to leap more wildly than before. Come the men on deck, their sleep out, and among them Herman, his face on the broad grin in appreciation of the breeze of wind I have picked up. I turn the wheel over to Warren, and start to go below, pausing on the way to rescue the galley stovepipe which has gone adrift. I am barefooted, and my toes have had an excellent education in the art of clinging, but as the rail buries itself in a green sea, I suddenly sit down on the streaming deck. Herman good-naturedly elects to question my selection of such a spot. Then comes the next roll, and he sits down, suddenly, and without premeditation. The snark heels over and down, the rail takes it green, and Herman and I, clutching the precious stovepipe, are swept down into the lee scuppers. After that I finish my journey below, and, while changing my clothes, grin with satisfaction. The snark is making easting. No, it is not all monotony. When we had worried along our easting to 126 degrees west longitude, we left the variables, and headed south through the doldrums, where was much calm weather, and where, taking advantage of every fan of air, we were often glad to make a score of miles in as many hours. And yet, on such a day, we might pass through a dozen squalls and be surrounded by a dozens more, and every squall was to be regarded as a bludgeon capable of crushing the snark. We were struck sometimes by the centers and sometimes by the sides of these squalls, and we never knew just where or how we were to be hit. The squall that rose up, covering half the heavens and swept down upon us, 
as likely as not split into two squalls which passed us harmlessly on either side while the tiny innocent-looking squall that appeared to carry no more than a hogshead of water and a pound of wind would abruptly assume cyclopean proportions deluging us with rain and overwhelming us with wind then there were treacherous squalls that went boldly astern and sneaked back upon us from a mile to leeward again two squalls would tear along one on each side of us and we would get a fillip from each of them now a gale certainly grows tiresome after a few hours but squalls never the, th the thousandth squall in one's experience is as interesting as the first one and perhaps a bit more so it is the tyro who has no apprehension of them the man of a thousand squalls respects a squall he knows what they are it was in the doldrums that our most exciting event occurred on november twenty we discovered that through an accident we had lost over one half of the supply of fresh water that remained to us since we were at that time forty-three days out from hilo our supply of fresh water was not large to lose over half of it was a catastrophe on close allowance the remnant of water we possessed would last twenty days but we were in the doldrums there was no telling where the southeast trades were nor where we would pick them up the handcuffs were promptly put upon the pump and once a day the water was portioned out each of us received a quart for personal use and eight quarts were given to the cook enters now the psychology of the situation no sooner had the discovery of the water shortage been made than i for one was afflicted with a burning thirst it seemed to me that i had never been so thirsty in my life my little quart of water i could easily have drunk in one draught and to refrain from doing so required a severe exertion of will nor was i alone in this all of us talked water thought water and dreamed water when we slept we examined the charts for possible islands to which to run in extremity but there were no such islands the marquesas were the nearest and they were the other side of the line and of the doldrums too which made it even worse we were in three degrees north latitude while the marquesas were nine degrees south latitude a difference of over a thousand miles furthermore the marquesas lay some fourteen degrees to the west of our longitude a pretty pickle for a handful of creatures sweltering on the ocean in the heat of tropic calms we rigged lines on either side between the main and mizzen riggings to these we laced the big deck awning hoisting it up aft with a sailing pennant so that any rain it might collect would run forward where it could be caught here and there squalls passed across the circle of the sea all day we watched them now to port or starboard and again ahead or astern but never one came near enough to wet us in the afternoon a big one bore down upon us it spread out across the ocean as it approached and we could see it emptying countless thousands of gallons into the salt sea extra attention was paid to the awning and then we waited warren martin and herman made a vivid picture grouped together holding on to the rigging swaying to the roll they were gazing intently at the squall strain anxiety and yearnings were in every posture of their bodies beside them was the dry and empty awning but they seemed to grow limp and to droop as the squall broke in half one part passing on ahead the other drawing astern and going to leeward but that night came rain martin whose psychological thirst had compelled him to drink his quart of water early got his mouth down to the lip of the awning and drank the deepest draught i have ever seen drunk the precious water came down in bucketfuls and tubfuls, and in two hours we caught and stored away in the tanks one hundred and twenty gallons. Strange to say, in all the rest of our voyage to the Marquesas, not another drop of rain fell on board. If that squall had missed us, the handcuffs would have remained on the pump, and we would have busied ourselves with utilizing our surplus gasoline for distillation purposes. Then there was the fishing one did not have to go in search of it for it was there at the rail a three-inch steel hook on the end of a stout line with a piece of white rag for bait was all that was necessary to catch bonitas weighing from ten to twenty-five pounds bonitas feed on flying fish wherefore they are unaccustomed to nibbling at the hook they strike as gamely as the gamest fish in the sea and their first run is something that no man who has ever caught them will forget also bonitas are the veriest cannibals 
the instant one is hooked he is attacked by his fellows often and often we haul them on board with fresh clean-bitten holes in them the size of teacups one school of bonitas numbering many thousands stayed with us day and night for more than three weeks aided by the snark it was great hunting for they cut a swath of destruction through the ocean half a mile wide and fifteen hundred miles in length they ranged along abreast of the snark on either side pouncing upon the flying fish her forefoot scared up since they were continually pursuing astern the flying fish that survived for several flights they were always overtaking the snark and at any time one could glance astern and on the front of a breaking wave see scores of their silvery forms coasting down just under the surface when they had eaten their fill it was their delight to get in the shadow of the boat or of her sails and a hundred or so were always to be seen lazily sliding along and keeping cool but the poor flying fish pursued and eaten alive by the bonitas and dolphins they sought flight in the air where the swooping seabirds drove them back into the water under heaven there was no refuge for them flying fish do not play when they essay the air it is a life and death affair with them a thousand times a day we could lift our eyes and see the tragedy played out the swift broken circling of a gunny might attract one's attention a glance beneath shows the back of a dolphin breaking the surface in a wild rush just in front of its nose a shimmering palpitant streak of silver shoots from the water into the air a delicate organic mechanism of flight endowed with sensation power of direction and love of life the gunny swoops for it and misses and the flying fish gaining its altitude by rising kite-like against the wind turns in a half circle and skims off to leeward gliding on the bosom of the wind beneath it the wake of the dolphin shows in churning foam so he follows gazing upward with large eyes at the flashing breakfast that navigates an element other than his own he cannot rise to so lofty occasion but he is a thorough-going empiricist and he knows sooner or later if not gobbled up by the gunny the flying fish must return to the water and then breakfast we used to pity the poor winged fish it was sad to see such sordid and bloody slaughter and then in the night watches when a forlorn little flying fish struck the mainsail and fell gasping and splattering on the deck we would rush for it just as eagerly just as greedily just as voraciously as the dolphins and bonitas for know that flying fish are the most toothsome for breakfast it is always a wonder to me that such dainty meat does not build dainty tissue in the bodies of the devourers perhaps the dolphins and bonitas are coarser fibred because of the high speed at which they drive their bodies in order to catch their prey but then again the flying fish drive their bodies at high speed too sharks we caught occasionally on large hooks with chain swivel bent on a length of small rope and sharks meant pilot fish and remoras and various sorts of parasitic creatures regular man-eaters some of the sharks proved tiger-eyed and with twelve rows of teeth razor sharp by the way we of the snark are agreed that we have eaten many fish that will not compare with baked sharks smothered in tomato dressing in the calms we occasionally caught a fish called hake by the japanese cook and once on a spoon hook trolling a hundred yards astern we caught a snake-like fish over three feet in length and not more than three inches in diameter with four fangs in his jaw he proved the most delicious fish delicious in meat and flavor that we have ever eaten on board the most welcome addition to our larder was a green sea turtle weighing a full hundred pounds and appearing on the table most appetizingly in steaks soups and stews and finally in a wonderful curry that tempted all hands into eating more rice than was good for them the turtle was sighted to windward calmly sleeping on the surface in the midst of a huge school of curious dolphins it was a deep-sea turtle of a surety for the nearest land was a thousand miles away we put the snark about and went back for him herman driving the grains into his head and neck when hauled aboard numerous remora were clinging to his shell and out of the hollows at the roots of his flippers crawled several large crabs it did not take the crew of the snark longer than the next meal to reach the unanimous conclusion that it would willingly put the snark about any time for a turtle but it is the dolphin that is the king of deep-sea fishes never is his color twice quite the same 
swimming in the sea an ethereal creature of palest azure he displays in that one guise a miracle of colour but it is nothing compared with the displays of which he is capable at one time he will appear green pale green deep green phosphorescent green at another time blue deep blue electric blue all the spectrum of blue catch him on a hook and he turns to gold yellow gold all gold haul him on deck and he excels the spectrum passing through inconceivable shades of blues greens and yellows and then suddenly turning a ghostly white in the midst of which are bright blue spots and you suddenly discover that he is speckled like a trout then back from white he goes through all the range of colors finally turning to a mother of pearl for those who are devoted to fishing i can recommend no finer sport than catching dolphin of course it must be done on a thin line with reel and pole a number seven o'shaughnessy tarpon hook is just the thing baited with an entire flying fish like the bonita the dolphin's fare consists of flying fish and he strikes like lightning at the bait the first warning is when the reel screeches and you see the line smoking out at right angles to the boat before you have time to entertain anxiety concerning the length of your line the fish rises into the air in a succession of leaps since he is quite certain to be four feet long or over the sport of landing so gamey a fish can be realized when hooked he invariably turns golden the idea of the series of leaps is to rid himself of the hook and the man who has made the strike must be of iron or decadent if his heart does not beat with an extra flutter when he beholds such gorgeous fish glittering in golden mail and shaking itself like a stallion in each mid-air leap wear slack if you don't on one of those leaps the hook will be flung out and twenty feet away no slack and away he will go on another run culminating in another series of leaps about this time one begins to worry over the line and to wish that he had had nine hundred feet on the reel originally instead of six hundred with careful playing the line can be saved and after an hour of keen excitement the fish can be brought to gaff one such dolphin i landed on the snark measured four feet and seven inches herman caught dolphins more prosaically a hand line and a chunk of shark meat were all he needed his hand line was very thick but on more than one occasion it parted and lost the fish one day a dolphin got away with a lure of herman's manufacture to which were lashed four o'shaughnessy hooks within an hour the same dolphin was landed with the rod and on dissecting him the four hooks were recovered the dolphins which remained with us over a month deserted us north of the line and not one was seen during the remainder of the traverse so the days passed there was so much to be done that time never dragged had there been little to do time could not have dragged with such wonderful seascapes and cloudscapes dawns that were like burning imperial cities under rainbows that arched nearly to the zenith sunsets that bathed the purple sea in rivers of rose-colored light flowing from a sun whose diverging heaven-climbing rays were of the purest blue overside in the heat of the day the sea was an azure satiny fabric in the depths of which the sunshine focused in funnels of light astern deep down when there was a breeze bubbled a procession of milky turquoise ghosts the foam flung down by the hull of the snark each time she floundered against the sea at night the wake was phosphorescent fire where the medusa slime resented our passing bulk while far down could be observed the unceasing flight of comets with long undulating nebulous tails caused by the passage of the bonitas through the resentful medusa slime and now and again from out of the darkness on either hand just under the surface larger phosphorescent organisms flashed up like electric lights marking collisions with the careless bonitas scurrying ahead to the good hunting just beyond our bowsprit we made our easting worked down through the doldrums and caught a fresh breeze out of south by west hauled up by the wind on such a slant we would fetch past the marquesas far away to the westward but the next day on tuesday november twenty sixth in the thick of a heavy squall the wind shifted suddenly to the southeast it was the trade at last there were no more squalls naught but fine weather a fair wind and a whirling log with sheets slacked off and with spinnaker and mainsail swaying bellying on either side 
The trade backed more and more until it blew out of the northeast, while we steered a steady course to the southwest. Ten days of this, and on the morning of December 6, at five o'clock, we sighted land, just where it ought to have been, dead ahead. We passed to leeward of Uahuka, skirted the southern edge of Nukahiva, and that night, in driving squalls and inky darkness, fought our way into an anchorage in the narrow bay of Taohe. The anchor rumbled down to the blatting of wild goats on the cliffs, and the air we breathed was heavy with the perfume of flowers. The traverse was accomplished, sixty days from land to land, across a lonely sea, above whose horizons never rise the straining sails of ships. End of chapter 9 Recorded by Brian Ness This recording is in the public domain.